We're going to be doing a Duke laser disc repair cervical. And uh, as you can see from the x-ray, we're able to displace the soft tissues like the esophagus and trachea to the side as I gain access to the spine from the front. So none of these surgeries are ever 100% guarantee it can happen. There's always a risk I can't do the surgery. And in this case, our patient's front of her neck is here. And I've lubricated the, the surface with my um, irrigation. You guys ready? And we've just made sure that we can access her spine safely. And I believe we can. Shot. Shot. Let's get a quick AP. As quick as you can. Make sure I'm midline. Go, go, go. That's it. Take a shot. Go back lateral. Looks, looks good. Shot. Okay. Shot. All right, Coker, AP, AP. Two, three, four, five. Sorry, I'm not more talkative yet. I have to make sure we get this done right. And I'll tell you a little more as we go along here. Okay, a little bit off to the right side. So I'm gonna re reposition this. So let's go back to a lateral. It's not horrible, but I would rather be more centered. Are we extending the neck? Shot. 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 Okay. AP. Okay, so that's good. Uh, let's take a look at the uh, lateral view, please. What are, why do we have all those EKG wires? Please, we need to get those out of there, guys, so we can have a clear view. The, we gotta be thinking about that ahead of time, Luis. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. All right, that looks really good, actually. All right, so today's, huh? Are you guys good? All right, so today's surgery, folks, is going to be um, repairing three cervical disc herniations in a patient who has three herniations with neck pain and arm pain on her left side and headaches coming from these discs. So the first disc I've accessed is the C4 disc. You can count from C2, 3, I'm sorry, C4, 5 disc, which is actually in the middle, correct, C4, 5? That's the middle disc. And I feel pretty good about our access. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and do a discogram where we can see the disc and see the tears. Shot in the back of the disc, shot. All right, good. So you can see the die has highlighted the, uh, the disc itself and you can see in the back of the disc, there's actually a herniation and the die is kind of wrapped around the back of the herniation. All right, so our, we've already made our incision with the needle, obviously, so our start has already occurred, shot. Okay, good. We've got our guide wire. I'm going to take out the needle and just leave the guide wire shot. Okay, I certainly don't wanna go in too far with that. Shot. Shot. That's better. And the guide wire is right at the foramen. And the foramen is on the side of the disc. It's right where, um, shot, 
it's right where the nerve root is. And if you look at the tip of the guide wire at the back of the vertebral body of C4, and you look just below it, there's a bulge there. That's actually a herniation. But that it looks like a, almost like a contact lens pointing to the spinal cord. That is the herniation. Okay, that's what we're after today. And what's unique about the Duke laser disc repair procedure is that <clears throat> it's the only surgery done in the world that actually um, doesn't take out the whole disc and repairs the annular tear. It's actually the tear in the back of the disc called the annular tear where the herniation comes out of and that's the source of the neck pain and headaches and arm symptoms as a matter of fact. We call that radiculitis when you have arm pain from inflammation um, that transmits onto the nerve root from the annular tear. I'm making my incision now. I'm making the incision with a number 11 blade. This is a very small blade and our incision in the skin is four millimeters, literally four millimeters. It's super tiny. Um, shot. So as I advance my dilator down to the disc, I want to watch on a lateral view and make sure that we're not you pushing the, the guide wire forward. Shot. So I'm going to, why is that wire, get that wire out of there please. So I'm going to uh, just carefully and slowly advance the dilator through the tissues. Shot. And the guide wire moved back just a little bit. I'm going to pull it forward a little. Shot. Shot. Yeah. So keeping an eye on it. Shot. The fingers are a bit sticky. Shot. Help me, Luis. Thanks. Shot. Okay, again, the guide wire has moved just a little bit forward. You got to always watch that shot. And it's not, it's not in a dangerous place, but we want to keep it from going somewhere it shouldn't be, like into the spinal cord, which can happen. Shot. I'm pretty close to the, I'm actually touching the anterior longitudinal ligament, which is the ligament running in front of the spine. Shot. So we're right there. We're literally right in front of the spine at the front of the disc. And I'm going to pass through this disc without damaging it, without removing it. And this is really one of the ways the Duke laser disc repair differs, AP, from other types of spine surgery in that we're not taking the whole disc out. We've lost one drop of blood, literally one drop. It's probably what we'll all we'll lose the whole surgery. That's typical. Yeah, we need those. Um, I don't know why you guys have all those wires there. So we're just a little bit to the um, patient's left side of the spine of the center, which is fine. Shot. Yeah, we're good. All right, guys. So what's what are those wires? Aren't they the EKG wires? Why are they there? They're either in the front of the patient or in the back of the patient. Usually. Usually they're in the back. So do you just need a couple of minutes? I'll wait. Not a problem. With what? All right, so basically we're going to pass through this disc and not damaging it we're going to get to the back of the disc where the tear and the herniation are. And it's the actual posterior annular tear causing all the symptoms this patient has. That tear, you know, that's, yeah, that's better, but it's not great. It's fine. Let's go back to a lateral, please. So I'm happy with the AP. You can see the spinous process right there. And we're literally just a few millimeters to the side of it on the left side, which is the side of the patient's symptoms. And 
there's actually a, about a one centimeter or 10 millimeter gap between the longest coli muscle shot. Um, and that's a safe zone to enter. You can even go through the longest coli if you have to, but I don't recommend it. Um, can you hold that head in extension, please? Let me know when you're ready. Okay. So shot, you're pulsing, right? Okay, good. I think I'm seated, shot, good. Take out my guide wire and shot. Very good. We'll make our way back to the herniation. And as I pass through this disc, this tube, this uh, dilator is spreading the jelly. So it's kind of like if you have some jello and you put a very skinny little tube, push it with a pointed tip in it, it'll literally won't chop the gel jello. It just spreads it open. And then you take the tube out or pencil out and the jello collapses back to where it was. So because the jelly in the center of the disc is basically uh, mostly water and uh, sugar, basically uh, carbohydrates, which we call sugars, um, there's really nothing to damage. There's no nerves in the disc that I'm passing through. There's no blood vessels in this part of the disc. It's literally pretty biologically inert shot. So basically, we're passing through the center of the disc and not damaging it. Now, every other surgery in the world, besides the Duke laser disc repair, and there's a, maybe a one or two other surgeons in the world that do this transdiscal uh, uh, discectomy, okay? Not the same as we do here, but they do a transdiscal approach, like in Korea, South Korea, that's where I learned the basics of the technique. I did not develop a transdiscal approach that was done by others. I learned from the South Koreans. But the South Koreans did several things different. And one of them is they basically um, kept the patients awake, first of all, which is I don't agree with uh, for the surgery. It's obviously very painful and the patients move around and it makes it very risky and dangerous. So one thing I changed was putting the patient to sleep. Um, and I think that's made for better patient care and better results. Again, I'm advancing this, this dilator very slow, uh, the tubular retractor very slow over the dilator for the reasons that I don't want to um, grab some tissue between the tube and the tube and the the dilator and then it would weld them together. We call it cold welding and they would move together. And because they move together, they would basically shot, they would um, uh, advance the, the dilator into the spinal canal, which I don't want to do. So let me see it. It's not where I want it yet. So I'm going to advance the dilator again. And then I'm going to advance the tubular retractor over the dilator shot. That should be good. I think we're as far in as we can go. We're right in the foramen area. I'm going to take my dilator out. Yep. Okay. So check it out. <clears throat> we, we basically, can you see this, John? Yes. I got to the front of the disc with this dilator and I pushed through to the back and the tip of the dilator was sitting right on the herniation, right at the base of the herniation where the herniation starts. And then I brought a, a tubular retractor over it. You can see the incision here, John, is only four millimeters. That's the width of the tube. The tube is four millimeters wide. So that's why the incision is four millimeters. All right, so we're removing our fluoro. We don't need it anymore. We use the uh, fluoro or x-ray machine to navigate down to the spine safely using uh, coordinates, AP and lateral. Well, watch that, watch that. All right, so now we're going to basically 
I've created a small path to the back of the disc where the herniation is causing all the neck pain, headaches, arm symptoms. And for every single patient in the world that has a herniated disc or bulging disc or degenerated disc, their symptoms are due to the same thing that we're fixing here. It is a tear in the back of the disc and a, a disc herniation that is causing inflammation within the tear. And so this surgery works for every person's neck pain that has a herniated disc causing it, um, which is most people actually. Herniated discs are the things that cause neck pain, headaches from the back of the neck called cervicogenic headaches, arm pain down the arm or numbness and tingling down the arm, or even weakness in your arm, okay? And it can also cause pressure on the spinal cord and that could cause a problem with uh, what's called myelopathy or damage to the spinal cord. So all those things can be corrected with the surgery. All right, it's a little out of focus, so I'm gonna try to adjust the focus first. And here we are at the back of the disc. We've left the entire disc alone. So why do doctors need to put a cage in there? Because they've taken the disc out, the whole disc, to get to the piece in the back that we're now about to get and treat. So basically, by doing it this way, you don't have to put a cage, you don't have to put an artificial disc, there's no need. But there are very few surgeons in the world, literally less than five in the world that know how to do this kind of approach, less this kind of treatment for the disc. But this is the most advanced surgery in the world for a herniated disc. The problem is very few of us have any experience or knowledge about how to do it. I've tried teaching other surgeons, but they're so uh, stubborn and arrogant, they don't want to learn. They, uh, and besides, they make a lot of money doing spinal fusions, putting metal in the spine. All of that is promoted by the big companies that sell the metal. They want people putting metal in spines. They want doctors putting metal in people's spines. That's how they make billions of dollars a year. I used to do a lot of metal because that was the only way to get rid of these people's suffering and pain. But turns out, the Koreans were the first to, to do these kind of endoscopic surgeries on the cervical spine. And I learned from them 16 years ago how to actually do the first part of the surgery where I put the needle and, and everything to get into the spine. And then of course I develop, this is not right. You, you have to have more, you know? No, you can't pull it because now you're gonna pull a contaminated thing onto the field, you can't do that. Okay, you have to plan it better from the beginning. Yeah, I guess we move around on yeah. this positioning and everything's good. Okay. I'll be nice to you today. <laughs> you sure? Yeah. I can be mean? Yeah, yeah. I, I don't feel like being mean to you, Luis. You're a good guy. You try your best, and I appreciate that. But. Just next time, let's try to have more slack, okay? So I'm using the laser. That's the little, uh, at 12 o'clock, you see a, a glass tube. And we're using that to deliver energy to the herniated disc. And this blue stuff I'm zapping right here, by the way, that is uh, the herniation. Um, and so that blue stuff is the nucleus propulsus. Trying to zoom in a little bit. Looks a little pixelated. I don't know. That's better. So what's up? Why do we have pixelations? Well, the reason is that this is what's called a fiber optic scope. It's not a rod lens scope. Fiber optic scopes use small fibers of glass. They're literally sub millimeter. That laser fiber you're looking at, folks, right there, that laser fiber is um, one, one millimeter, sorry, half a millimeter across. Oh, look at that herniation right there. That's a good size one. Okay, that's a big herniation right there. And it's stuck to the annular tear. And that's what I'm doing. I'm doing a debridement. I'm removing the attachments of the herniation. Standby laser. 
I'm removing the attachments of the herniation to the annulus using the laser. Okay. I can't tell if it's there. It looks like I got it. Is it there? Uh, Let me see. Yeah, you're right. It's mostly there. Let's see if I can free it up a little. There it goes. There it goes. Look at that. It's coming out now. Okay, good. So um, the surgery is really you take the herniation out in pieces. We call it piecemeal. I have had some where the whole thing kind of comes out, but there's still a little few pieces left, and you just go back and get those. But like 95% of these surgeries that I do with herniated discs, I take the, the herniation out a little bit at a time. Um, and you can see this tube, remember, is four millimeters wide on the outside. So the inside of the tube is, um, is about 3.4 millimeters. So when a herniation fills the entire tube, you know that it's a pretty good size piece. So right here, you can see Right over there, that thing is the bone. It's called the vertebral end plate. And that's literally the vertebral end plate of C5. And we're doing the C4-5 disc. So the vertebral end plate on the other side at, nine o at basically 9 o'clock would be um, the C4 end plate. Okay. So this is endoscopic spine surgery. It's new technology. Unfortunately, not many doctors know how to do it still. And like any new technology, it takes training, it takes time, it takes experience to learn. And I've been trying to teach other doctors for years um, how to do it in the United States and world. And so far, there's nobody that's completed the training that's able to do these surgeries uh, the way we do them at Duke Spine Institute elsewhere. So Duke Spine Institute remains, there's another herniation, remains the only place to go for the surgery. We're here in Florida, near Orlando. Um, so I'm across the disc now, I'm looking at the patient's right-sided foramen and you can see the herniation goes all the way across the back of the disc. Again, that right there is bone, that's the end plate, and this is the, the back of the uh, bone. And you're looking at the fibers of what's called the posterior longitudinal ligament. There's some bone spurs right there. And then below that is the spinal cord. And so I'm staying away from the spinal cord. Wow, another herniation right there coming out. And really a lot of what I do, like 98% 90, of what I'm doing here is called an annular debridement. And it's the first surgery in the world to ever do an annular debridement. And it's the annular debridement that's necessary to get rid of the neck pain in this patient. Or if it's in the lower back, the back pain. Or if it's in the thoracic spine, the thoracic pain. So wherever your herniated disc is, we can get rid of the pain because we're doing what's called an annular debridement. Other surgeons don't do annular debridements. That's why they can't cure back pain or neck pain, okay? And so the annular debridement is the essential part of the surgery to cure the, the pain in the spine. And of course, the pain in the arm or leg as well that comes from inflammation of that nerve root. For those of you who don't know, Duke Spine Institute, we have an app. It's free on the iPhone and on the Android. It's called Duke Spine Institute. Just go to the App Store and you can um, download the app for free. I'm, thank you, Luis. I'm actually uh, pushing the laser back a little bit so I can get a little closer, a little closer look at what I'm doing here. Want to make sure we're very careful in this area. This patient has herniations on both sides at this disc at C4-5. You can see the herniation here that I'm zapping away. And look at, the, look at the golden color. That means that it's been there and it's calcifying. It's actually degenerating. People ask me 
Um, okay, I see herniated disc, but do I have degenerative disc? The answer is yes. All uh, herniations are basically degenerated discs. Um, the first step in degenerated disc disease and collapse of the disc, de desiccation of the disc, is a herniation. So we're going from one side to the other, okay? Pretty amazing with this technique. You can treat both sides of the disc herniation with this type of surgery by just going across from one side to the other. Her arm symptoms are primarily left-sided, so now we're in the left foramen at C4-5, and I'm making sure we've cleared out the herniation. That's the uncinate process on the right. And I want to make sure I get all this herniated disc material. But we want to make sure we don't get into the fecal sac, which is the covering around the spinal cord. You can pull back on your tube a little bit. I have to do that quite often to redirect my laser and scope. But there it is. That is the foramen at C4-5 on the left. And we have already gotten the herniations out of it earlier. Then we went to her right side. I feel really good. We're pretty much done at this disc. Look at that. No fusion necessary, no cages necessary, no metal, no plate, no artificial disc, nothing. Why? Because we're literally just taking the part of the disc that's causing all the problems out, the part in the back. And this is the most advanced spine surgery in the world for degenerative conditions. We don't use this to treat tumors yet or anything else. We treat pretty much herniated discs, bulging discs, degenerated discs. This surgery works for all those conditions. And um, I had a, a patient yesterday who came in with a tumor uh, and I, I had to tell her, I'm sorry, we don't treat spine tumors here. You know, just so people know, we are a, a center that treats degenerated discs. So herniated discs, bulging discs, basically neck pain and back pain, but not tumors. So anyway, we are open for questions. We're done with the uh, C4-5 and the foramen is clear. We're going to take the scope out and I'm going to next uh, move. Thank you, Luis. I'm going to move to uh, the next disc. I'm going to try to do this without taking anything Stand out. Now we have to do three discs. We started with the middle one. That's typically what I do when I have three in the neck. So what we're going to do here is we're going to get everything situated properly. All right. Let's, uh, you want to pull, the, just leave the laser there. Okay. Okay. Right there is good. Make sure we don't pull any of these cables onto the field, okay? Um, so this is probably the, the second hardest or hardest part of the surgery. We're gonna bring our x-ray machine back in. We use an x-ray machine because I need to see the spine. I need to see where we are. We're actually operating on the spine and the x-ray machine is the best tool in the world to um, you to navigate we call it navigating and what navigating means is it means getting to the right part of the spine and the reason is that x-rays see bones and joints really good and so we're able to use this machine to in real time take pictures and immediately know where we are okay let's go lateral please what's wrong let's go lateral So a lateral x-ray is a side shot, side to side, through the spine. And AP is anterior posterior, it's front to back. So I use a combination of side to side, which is lateral, AP, which is front to back, and oblique shots. The most common I use for this type of surgery is lateral. And that's true for lumbar, thoracic, and um, cervical. But you do need also to have the uh, AP view. Okay, so at this point we need to see and I put my dilator back down the tube and I'm going to remove 
the tubular retractor. Just press the, the screen. Is that our shot right there? I need to know over there. That's it? Yeah. All right, is that a true lateral? It looks like you're a little oblique. Is the head just rotated or what? Is that a, just get me a true lateral. You got it? You happy with it? All right. I can see my dilator in there. I'm sorry, you guys aren't able to see this. We're trying to get it working, but um, I need to keep going. Shot. So the, removing the tube out of the disc that was docked in the back where the herniation and annular tear were and taking it out. And then we're going to, of course, shot. We're going to now, okay, just wait a minute, see if we can't get the audiovisual back up. And then I'm going to take this instrument out of C4-5, and I'm going to walk my way down to C5-6. Um, That's the next disc down. How come we're having technical issues like that? Crystal's not here? Oh, she's on break? Yeah. Oh, that's why. All right, that's fine. Now you know, <laughs> now you know. All right, so are you able to see the x-ray image now, John? Uh, yes, I see the one with your hands holding yeah. the dilator. Perfect. Okay, so um, take a look at what we've got here through the eye in the sky. You can see this is the patient's neck. They're facing up. This is the Adam's apple. I've moved the trachea and esophagus medial this way. I've moved the carotid artery and the carotid sheath that way. And we've gone between them, which is the standard approach for anything related to the front of the spine or the spine through what's called an anterior cervical approach. And now I'm going to move this dilator down to the next disc. So. You ready? This is, uh, I just need to focus now and then we can answer questions. Shot. So I wanna get it out of the disc space and I wanna dock it right on the front of the spine, right on the ALL. Okay, I'm on the outside the disc. Now I need an AP to make sure that I'm in the center. Before you go anywhere, you have to stay in the center. And the center really is an area between the longest coli muscles where the anterior longitudinal ligament lives. Oh, please, you're killing me, guys. We those, still have the, those wires. We still have the wires, guys. That's just really interfering. Is that the latest right there? Is that the shot? Yes, sir. Right there, shoot it again. Can you guys please get those wires out of there? Let me know when you're going to move her because I've got the dilator docked on the front of the spine. All right, if you can't do it safely, quickly, then I'll just have to live with the wires there. But, you know, going forward, let's not have EKG wires in our field. Much better. Thank you. All right, everybody ready? I'm going to start moving this thing south. You guys all ready? Go lateral, please. So once you verify you're in the middle, which I am, I'm a little bit off to her right, but I could correct as I go south. And of course, I'll re-verify with another AP, AP anterior posterior. We are gonna move this slide, and really the key here is sliding the tip south along the ALL. I do not lift this tip off the spine. I literally slide it. Now, are there little veins on the front? Yes. Sean, there are, and you know, sometimes we get those little veins and tear them, um, but that's a small concern. And you can get a little bit of blood. All right, I know, need another AP. So I've moved south about a centimeter, centimeter, whatever you want to call it, and I'm heading right towards the C5-6 disc, too. But I'm a little bit off to her right, so I want to correct again. Stay there. 
and I went south a little bit more, again, feeling the ALL the whole time. Let's see, it's their soft tissues. They're sliding me. Shot, sliding a little bit. Yeah, uh, lateral. So there's a little bone spur here, probably, or a bump, like an anterior herniation in the front of 5.6 that's kind of pushing my, the tip of my dilator back up towards the, towards the north. We call it north, north is towards the head. So two, three, four, five, six. So I'm just gonna have to uh, slide it back south, try to get over the disc, which I think I feel here, shot. Yeah, a little bit below. Go a little bit north. There, shot. AP. I need a quick shot back to a lateral. That's a perfect, perfect, perfect lateral, lateral, lateral quickly. Please. All right, so that's really good. Mallet, hold the head. And really you just wanna at least get this started. Hold on and, oh, shot, that's fine. Radiate my hand. I don't mind. It's okay. I'm kidding. All right. Coker, AP. We're almost there. You're holding her like in extension, right? Like pushing the occiput, sliding it towards her shoulder. Good. That's perfect. I appreciate you doing that. All right. Perfect. Again, lateral. So you have to check at least two planes. AP lateral. You can use an oblique, but I don't recommend it. Um, not for this type of surgery. It's not necessary and it might throw you off. But you definitely need an AP and lateral to make sure you're safely navigating. Shot. Okay, good. I feel it going in, shot. At this point, we'll do our discogram. Got a pipe cleaner. I want to make sure I get any schmutz that's inside out what's schmutz nuclear material shot so i can actually use the center of the dilator now shot to to do my discogram which i really would like to have shot shot all right perfect nice work everyone I can still get it in the hole. Shot. All right, and there's your discogram. So what we're injecting, shot, is um, two things, three things, a little saline that's sterile, and we're injecting our special Duke Spine blue dye. It's the blood from every Duke Spine employee that we collect on a monthly basis. Yes, that's what it is. And they're all blue bleeders. You can, you can let go. Thank you. And they all donate it, you know. Shot. And so that blue dye stains what? It stains what's called degenerative nucleus propulsus. That's really what it stains. Um, the nucleus propulsus, which is the jelly in the center, once it herniates, shot. That was a good one. Shot. Perfect. All right, so we're at the back of the disc. When, the, when you get an annular tear and the nucleus propulsus squeezes through it, the annulus responds to that by saying, hey, you're not supposed to be here. And it brings the inflammatory system in right to the tear. And there's a battle that occurs. And it's literally your body attacking the jelly, the nucleus propulsus, attacking it, attacking it. And that's where all the neck pain comes from. That's where all the arm pain comes from. But unfortunately, I'm the only one that knows this because I discovered it. So if you go to other doctors and say, hey, you know, there's inflammation going on in the back of my disc, will you go fix it? They're gonna look at you like you're crazy. 
because that information hasn't gotten out yet. Um, it's kind of like the first time gunpowder was used, right, to use in rifles against people with bows and arrows, for example. I'm not advocating that that should be used that way, but it's an example, like when the people with bows and arrows got shot with bullets from a rifle using gunpowder, they actually thought that uh, the gods had come down and were influencing the battle because they couldn't see the bullet. They didn't understand the mechanism. It was totally foreign. The technology was totally foreign to them and so advanced. Well, this is the same thing. What we're doing here is like that discovery, yet it hasn't, the knowledge hasn't disseminated around the world yet, unfortunately, and because of that, most doctors who treat spine things, they don't know how to do this stuff. They don't even know it exists. And that's a problem for you, the patients, because that means you're not gonna get access to this until everyone's trained around the world. But until then, I'm gonna keep broadcasting, trying to teach these doctors about this technology. Obviously, this is not gunpowder where you're hurting people, this is helping people. So it's the opposite. Um, so it's a good thing, but the problem is, is you're not going to hear about it by your local doctor. They don't know it even exists. They're just, when they hear about the surgery or see it, they're just shocked that it even exists. They have no clue that it exists. So what we're doing is what every good surgeon wants to do, which is to go and take care of the herniation, get rid of it without actually opening the patient up. So it's quite an, an amazing surgery. All right, you ready? We're gonna advance the tubular retractor down through the disc once again. And make our way to the back where the herniation is at the annular tear shot. And again, it's just a few millimeters at a time, always taking pictures. And what I'm saying folks is shot. Shot means take a picture, um, like a, a shot, a, a, uh, a photo shot. It's an old lingo, so I'm a bit dated, but um, that's okay. I use outdated lingo, but I use advanced technologies. So I've adapted somewhat. So again, the um, dilator has come back a little bit, so I want to advance it. Otherwise, you're just doing a biopsy with your tube and you don't want to do that. All right, I think we're pretty much as far in as we can go. And what's limiting me right now is the uncinate process. If you know what that is, it's off to the side. It's a curvature in the back of the bone. And I don't want to, I don't want to hurt it. I, I feel it, you know, as I'm tapping and I can feel it and I know I've hit my limit. All right. So getting back to the Duke spine blue dye. This blue dye, it stains only nuclear material, nucleus propulsus, that is degenerated. So if you noticed, every herniation I've done has staining, which means every herniation I've done has degenerated this. So for, for people who don't understand the concept, all disc herniations are degenerated discs. It's just, you know, early on it's at the very beginning and it's not much degeneration but as time progresses if you don't get that tear fixed with the laser surgery we're doing then then the degeneration is only going to get worse wait wait before you go lights off i want to show those people who came in late what we're doing okay our patient is has three herniated discs in her neck she's had horrible neck pain headaches coming from her neck up to the back of her head and arm down the left arm, pain, numbness, and weakness and tingling. So we diagnosed the cause being the three herniations in her spine, the herniated discs, bulging discs. They're small. They're really not big ones at all. And um, what, what's causing her symptoms is not the big herniation part, the jelly part. It's actually the tear where the jelly comes through. And that's what's revolutionary. We now know what causes the neck pain. It's the tear. We now know what causes the arm pain. It's the tear and inflammation getting on the nerve root. And we now know what causes the headaches from a herniated disc. It's the inflammation and the tear getting on the dura. And the dura is the covering of the spinal cord. It wraps around the brain. 
So when you inflame the dura, it actually causes headaches because the dura is a pain sensitive structure. So we can explain neck pain, headaches from the neck and arm symptoms all from inflammation in the annular tear. And once again, you're not gonna hear this in any textbooks or from other surgeons because it's new. It's a new discovery here at Duke Spine Institute. We've made the discovery about 10 years ago and we're just trying to get the information out to people that, that care, that want to know the truth. Any questions, John? Uh, yes, one of our viewers from Facebook is wondering, is the annular tear actually sealed or just cleaned up? What would stop yeah. a herniation from bursting through again? All right, great question from Facebook. Is the annular tear, with this surgery, is the annular tear just cleaned up or is it sealed? The answer is it's just cleaned up. We do not seal the annular tear. There is no way to seal the annular tear. There's no safe way to seal the annular tear today. Someday there will be, but not today. Um, doctors have tried putting all kinds of stuff to seal the annular tear and it doesn't work. Uh, it just pops out. And guess what? When it pops out, it pops out onto the nerve and spinal cord. So it's really bad. So there's no, um, nothing that works, nothing that I would ever put in my patients. Um, you know, we've put stem cells in here after surgery to help things heal. Um, it actually worked well, but in the very beginning it didn't. The patient was in more pain. By the way, look at all the chunk chunks here. These are all pieces of herniated disc. We're gonna get to them, but I just want you to see that herniated disc is not like one piece. It's like many pieces. There's some right there. And really, you just got to take them all out piece by piece. So this is definitely a herniated disc. And this is the number 5-6. I'm going to try to grab some of that out because lasering all that is going to, it's going to take too much time. Not that I have somewhere to go, but um, time under anesthesia is not good. You want to minimize it. This patient is asleep. They are under general anesthesia. And so the less anesthesia we give them, the better. And the faster they recover, okay? The recovery for this patient will be one hour, even though they've had general anesthesia. Um, I like to switch them to Tiva, maybe near the end. Doctor, I don't know if you're aware of that, like propofol, kind of get them to get the gases out. All right, so here we are working on the herniation with the laser. You can all see the laser just, and this is all, um, by the way, the white stuff here is scar tissue. So why is there scar tissue back here? There shouldn't be. Uh, that's not normal. It's there because of the inflammation. There's only one thing that causes scar tissue. And anybody know what that is? It's inflammation. It's like the final stage of healing. Every tissue in the body makes scar tissue except the brain when it's injured. The brain doesn't make scar tissue. It makes uh, a, what's called a gliotic scar, which is made from microglia and astrocytes, which I don't want to go into since we're not doing brain surgery. But every other tissue in the body makes coll collagenized scar tissue, okay? Um, except for the brain. So what we're dealing with here is a lot of scar tissue from the disc herniation. And then the golden stuff that you're seeing there, the little faint gold is calcium and why would there be calcium here because it's not normal to have calcium here by the way it's not normal at all it's called dystrophic calcification by the way this is a huge herniation in the foramen on the left side this is probably oh look at that oh yeah we're gonna get that that is a herniation in the foramen this is probably the one causing most of her left arm symptoms and that's that's her main complaint. So what causes the left arm symptoms? It's a combination of pressure, but also it's a combination of inflammation and pressure from the herniation. Everyone thinks it's pressure, pressure, pressure from a big herniation, but that's not the case. Most of the time it's inflammation. That's why epidural steroid injections work because they reduce the inflammation temporarily in that area. We're just giving a more permanent fix. I didn't get it out. You see how big it is? It's just sitting there. I'm gonna have to 
There we go. That's a little better. I might be able to grab it now. The geometry of some of these herniated fragments is such that it's really hard to, really, to get them out. I just felt like a tug on that thing, but I don't think I got it. I may have to just get in there and break it up some more. I just can't seem to get it out. But, you know, some of these herniations are easier. Some of them take more time. This is one that's going to fight us a little bit, maybe. The nice thing is the laser doesn't just vaporize. Look at that, just, just chopping it. The laser doesn't just vaporize, but it also creates a pressure wave. So I just released the herniation. For those of you that just saw that, that was pretty cool. I just kind of sliced it at, from like uh, 9 to 11, all right? 9 to 11 o'clock. And that released it off the end plate. And now I'm going to go in there and grab it out, I hope. But that's what the surgery is. Yeah, there it is. We got it. You hear that sucking noise as it came out? It's, it's a big piece. Let's put the light on. Light on, please. John, come on in and take a look at this thing. It's pretty cool. Look at that, guys. So you all see this? John, you see this? Uh, yes, I just have to zoom out. Zoom so I in can on get it, it so you can see it. That is a piece of herniation that was sitting in the left foramen at C5-6. Pretty damn cool. And we got it out under direct visualization. I'm telling you, endoscopic spine surgery is the future of all degenerative spine surgery. Unfortunately, I'm the only one that does it in the United States and probably the world right now for the neck. That's fine. Thank you. And then this little grabber here is, a, is an endoscopic grabber. We call it a pituitary. Look how long it is. All right. People wonder why these surgeries are expensive to do. They're not as much as fusions. They're less, you know, 50 to 75 percent less. But this, like just this grabber is over $1,000, you know, just to give you an idea. Then I can't get a discount on it. Here you go. That's, that's, a, that's a discounted rate. I mean, the, these, all this stuff, the scope right here is $12,000 now. Um, so everything, the camera is another $12,000. Everything is very, very expensive in medicine. I'll tell you a funny story. It's not funny actually, but it's upsetting. When we built our surgery center, um, we wanted to have these 72 inch monitors inside the operating room. So um, I told my IT guy, go to Best Buy or BJ's and buy the 72 inch monitors. So we did and we paid, um, there's another herniation. We paid 500 bucks per TV and we've got two of them in here, right? 500 bucks, no joke. Then Aka came and said, ooh, what is that? <laughs> You're not allowed to have that 72-inch TV from BJ's or, or Best Buy here. You need a medical-grade television. Medical-grade, that's the word, medical-grade. So we looked up, and guess what? $10,000 per television. I spent $20,000 for two of those TVs. And I asked my um, engineer, the electrical engineers, right way, I said, what's the difference? He said, they put a sticker on this one and they sell it as medical. I said, you're kidding me. He goes, no, that's all they do. So the price went from 500 to $10,000 per TV. Disgusting. And people, people are like, why is healthcare so expensive? It's, a, it's the corruption. That's what makes it expensive. It's the corruption in healthcare. And unfortunately, that cost is passed on to people. So this show is all about truth in healthcare. I don't lie about things. I tell you guys the truth. Unfortunately, a lot of it sucks to hear. But you can do something about it. Why? Because the only way to fix healthcare in the United States and the rest of the world is through a grassroots effort. You've got to get your politicians on board with fixing it. Unfortunately, the politicians are corrupt and they are owned and controlled by lobbyists and lobbyists are controlled by whoever pays the most money. And so that is unfortunately going to be your insurance companies and your medical device companies and your pharmaceutical companies. They control health care and they're the ones responsible for the high cost of health care. I think most people are starting to understand that. But Unfortunately, it's not going to be fixed by one person. It's really going to take 
a lot of people fighting back for their health care. And honestly, in my opinion, you should fight because it's worth fighting for. When people take your health care away, the country will sink you know, down to the bottom of the, uh, the world's ratings for health care. Oh my gosh, that's already happened. <laughs> we used to be number one in the United States, now we're like 40th or something. Who wants to look up, where does the United States rank on, in health care in the world? I wonder wh where it is today. It's not good, I can tell you that. And it's not that we don't invest the money, we do. Problem is, these big companies are siphoning off all the money into their pockets. All right, there's another herniation right there that just floated out. You can see how we zapped it there with the laser, come on, to get it to release from the annular tear. So, why do big companies not want you people to know about the Duke Laser Disc Repair? Because their business will go down. They will not sell as many screws and rods and cages. They will lose billions of dollars when this surgery becomes common every day around the world surgery. We're ranked at 37, so I was three off. I said 40, right? Yeah. So 37, we've been hovering around 40th for a long time. The United States ranked 40th in the world in healthcare. Thank you for sharing that with us. Number one is France. Well, I'm sure the French, no offense to the French, but I'm sure they paid for that. <laughs> Just kidding. I like French people. Heck, my son may be driving someday for them at Alpine. That's a herniation, by the way, in case you haven't been paying attention. It came right out of the foramen on the left side at C56. I have to go retrieve it. It's not floating up the way I like it to. Wow, another big herniation. I'm not going to stop the show and show you, but it's about the same size as the last one I showed you guys. So far, we've taken a lot of these herniated fragments out. By the way, this patient, uh, I can share with you, uh, injured her neck at work, I believe. And this is a, a work comp patient. And we do get quite a few of them. And it's a good thing because, I mean, it's a good thing we get them. Because the ones that we see and take care of, we can do laser surgery. Anywhere, or anywhere else, if they even operate on her, it would be um, fusion. Okay, so beautiful. That's the foramen. For all the scientists out there, the neurosurgeons, that is the neuroforamen I'm looking at. That blue thing is the nerve root, okay? And uh, that's the uncinate process over there to the right. And this is still part of the tear, the annular tear. And I am really stretching to get out the foramen now. And I just want to get the last bit of this herniation that's literally just sitting on top of the nerve root. Now, at some point, this becomes what's called foramenal ligament, which is what's left. We're done. We've gotten all the herniation. Um, foramenal ligament is a normal structure. It's part of the ligamentum flavum. It just extends out into the foramen. It's called the foramenal ligament. It just has a special name, but it's just a ligament. All right, so there's still herniation here towards the center. You can see all the frayed uh, annular fibers. Now look at the edge there of the bone. That is literally the back of the end plate of C5, and this is C4 up here. See the white? That's the end plate. That's cartilage on the end plate. And look at this. That's a little bone spur right there. Can you get rid of bone spurs? Absolutely. Goodbye. So people who say lasers can't get rid of bone spurs, they're lying to you. They don't know because they're not laser surgeons. Okay, that's one of the big things I hear in, on the internet today is all this. For those of you who don't know, doctors, surgeons who don't use the laser are never going to admit the laser's better. Why? Because they don't do it. Would you admit to anyone that something you don't do is actually better than what you do do? No. The only reason your surgeons don't know how to do these surgeries is because they never took the time to go train. 
they, they not, they're not developing themselves, okay? There's another herniation right there I'm gonna go get. You know, you should blame your surgeons and doctors for not keeping up to date to the latest in technology and understanding of disease. And you should make sure you go to someone who is the best at what they do. There's no excuse in my mind for spine doctors who don't know about this type of surgery, Duke laser disc repair. We've done everything we can to make the people aware of it. I've gone to the meetings and given talks. I even went to Hong Kong and spoke at the biggest, one of the biggest spine meetings in the world. I've gone to the American Association of Neurological Surgeons meeting. I've gone to the Congress of Neurosurgeons. I've gone to the Florida Neurosurgery Society, the Southern Neurosurgery Society, and they've all invited me and I've all presented, even Becker's Spine Review. But despite all these doctors hearing about what we do and watching videos of how I do it, they still don't do it. Why? Because they make more money doing fusions. Make more money doing fusions and artificial discs. Remember that. Your doctors that don't offer Duke laser disc repair are choosing to do a more invasive, more damaging surgery to you rather than send you to the very best. Now, yesterday I had a patient who came in. She had a tumor of the spine, okay? So, what would a good doctor like me do? I'm sorry, I'm not the best at treating tumors. What would a greedy doctor who doesn't care about the patient do, who doesn't do a lot of spine tumors? Hey, I'll do your surgery. Now, the patient will have complications, they'll have a bad result, but you know what? The doctor doesn't care. Am I entitled to do spinal tumors? Yes, I'm a neurosurgeon. Why don't I do them? Because I haven't done them in like 15 years. So I'm not the right person to do it. Plus, we don't have a comprehensive program. We don't have oncology. We don't have hematology, radiation oncology. We don't have a comprehensive program. That patient is better served going elsewhere. Did I lose money because I sent the patient somewhere else for their tumor? Absolutely, we lost money. But was it the right thing to do for the patient? Absolutely, it was. So it's no, it's no foreign idea that doctors specialize. There's a herniation just came out. So why do doctors who don't keep up to date on the latest advances in spine, degenerative spine surgery, why do they still do surgery on patients? And the answer is money and greed. I'm sorry, but it's true. Okay, I'm sorry, but it's true. And they should be referring patients or they should go educate themselves on the latest t techniques like the endoscopic surgery we're doing right now. Okay. There are 6,000 spine surgeons in the United States today. 6,000 plus or minus. Half of them are neurosurgeons, half are orthopedic surgeons. Why have they not gone out and learned to do this? Because it's better for the patient and there's no fusion or metal involved. And the answer is unfortunately, they are compensated better by doing fusions and artificial discs. I did for years many of these surgeries, poorly compensated or not paid at all. I did hundreds of them, unpaid. I actually paid my own money for the patients to have the surgery. Okay, most people would say, well, geez, that's awfully generous and kind of you. Yeah, well, I didn't do it on purpose, trust me. You can't run a medical office and pay all these people that I have to pay from my own money without getting money from the insurance company or the patient. It's just that simple. We don't have federal programs funding us. The government doesn't really care about your pain and suffering. I'm sorry. So I had to pay for it out of my own pocket. And I did for years. I paid for people's surgeries unintentionally with the promise that we would be paid. Many of them were auto accident patients who then got paid and then their attorneys chose not to pay my bill or our bill. So I ended up having to pay for their surgeries. If I told you how much money, it would spin your eyeballs in your head, so I'm not gonna bother. But it was, you know, let's just say millions. Did I stop? No, I kept going. Why? Because people need this technology. And, 
you know, someone has to champion this cause. And someone has to make the world aware of it. And that's us at Duke Spine Institute, I guess. It's not what I envisioned my career to be. I didn't know I'd be fighting insurance companies and fighting implant companies, and fighting other for-profit entities just to give people the best surgery in the world. But this was God's calling for me, and that's why I'm doing it. All right, it looks like we're having trouble with our irrigation. Are we? Are we good? All right, thanks. So we're just about done with this disc, number 5-6. And then I'll have the pleasure of traveling up past the uh, disc we've already done, 4-5, and fixing the, uh, the next disc up there, which is going to be the 3-4, uh, if I can get to it. So Now the good news is 3-4, if I don't get to it, is the least herniated of all. And I think the least symptomatic, but I think it is still symptomatic. By the way, I've gone from the patient's the left foramen all the way to the right foramen. That's what this herniation is here. You can see it's not as bad on the patient's right side, but there's still bone spurs, which I'm zapping away. These are all bone spurs here. See how quickly the laser dispatches of bone spurs? It's not even a question. For those of you who watch my surgeries often, you'll see that the metal tubes at the end where the laser does its work actually have melting spots. So the laser melts through steel easily. And we try not to do that because I don't want to replace these tubes. They're very expensive. Um, but that said, sometimes I have to replace the tubes because they get damaged from the laser. So lasers go through metal. For those of you who don't know, lasers actually cut steel. And um, this laser is no exception. It's extremely powerful. We only have it actually on 20% of its full power, 20% and it's cutting through bone spurs and melting the metal. So think about that. All right, the, the, the surgery is done at this level. I'm very happy. We've gotten rid of all the herniation back there. We've debrided the annular tear. So what's gonna happen now? Well, that area back there will heal and it's gonna heal with something called collagen, collagen. Collagen is a protein that your body makes in healing. And guess what? the annular tear, the annulus, is made out of collagen. In other words, the annulus will heal by the body with the same material that the annulus is made out of. And this is exceptional, by the way, in case you don't know that. Like when you have damage to your heart and you get scar tissue or collagen, the heart muscle is replaced by scar tissue. That's bad. When you damage your... your um, your kidneys or any other organ, your intestine, scar tissue, collagen comes in and takes its place. So normal tissue like muscle or kidney or other important tissues are replaced by collagen. But guess what? The annular tear is the only tissue that actually gets healed by its own self, by its own tissue. So it's an amazing uh, adaptation the, and it's an amazing response to healing. So people ask me, go to la we need lateral. People ask me, you know, can you put something else in there? Why? Why would I put something unnatural in there? If anything, we could put collagen, but honestly, I don't think it's going to make a difference. Your body has to synthesize the collagen. What is the problem? We, yeah, why, what are we struggling with, guys? All right, so for those of you who joined us late, I'm Dr. Duke Majin, CEO and founder of Duke Spine Institute. Take your time, go slow, okay? Check everything, Don't make, make sure nothing pops off. All right, so um, this patient we're doing surgery on has three herniated discs in her neck at C3, 4, C4, 5, C5, 6. The herniations are causing neck pain, headaches, arm symptoms. She's had it ever since she injured her neck at work. We've been trying to get her surgery approved by work comp. They finally agreed. Um, do we have a work comp department at Duke Spine? Yes. Why? Because work comp patients have a hard time getting their surgeries approved, and we want to help them, you know, overcome that. And other doctors don't do that. They don't help the work comp patients. 
you know, work comp patients, their insurance is so brutal. They just deny everything. They don't want to take care of these people for the most part. And I don't blame work comp. And I'm going to tell you why. Because unfortunately, most surgeons that do surgery on work comp patients, they only fix one disc at a time and the patients still have problems. So the work comp carrier goes, well, we just paid for surgery and the patient's still having pain and they can't go back to work. So what's the point? Well, Duke Spine Institute offers a guarantee. We guarantee our patients will be released back to work because their neck pain will be gone. And if it doesn't go away, then we cover all the costs needed to fix it so it does go away. That's a guarantee. It's available to anyone who wants it. It does mean you have to pay the full price for the surgery up and agree, and agree to do it up front. So it's a little bit more money, but at least you get the peace of mind knowing that whatever we do, we take care of. So if you have issues ongoing afterwards, you just come back. Alrighty then, we are done with C45, C56. We're gonna try to get up to C34, you ready? It's not gonna be easy and I may not be able to do it, but I'm gonna do my damn best trying to get up there. So same process, dilator goes back in. Again, tube comes out, shot. Mm. Why are we not seeing that? Have we been pulling on the shoulders normally? Louise, get a shoulder pull there, please. Shot. Okay, that looks good. That looks good. Thank you. You just went further south? Oh, what'd you do? Increase your shot? I just changed the Okay. All right, you can see the tubular retractor is pulling out of the disc, leaving the dilator there. Almost done. Shot. I think we're out. <laughs> Alrighty then. Sticky, sticky. That just means that I made my skin incision exactly four millimeters, so it's grabbing onto the four millimeter tube. Okay, folks, take a look at that. Beautiful. We've had one drop of blood. I'm just going to give it a minute. Let's see. Take a picture. Now I have to transfer the tip of this dilator along the front of the spine, sliding along the anterior longitudinal ligament to go from this disc up to, to C3-4. Do not try this at home. While we're waiting, do you have a question from the audience, John? We're, we're streaming live, by the way, over the internet, every single one of these surgeries, through YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. Uh, yes, there are two similar questions from a Facebook and a YouTube viewer who are stating that they have had fusion surgery in the past mm. would and now they still have herniated discs with Shot. symptoms. Is another fusion wise AP. or is there another uh, treatment option available? Oh, don't don't advance the tip. All right, so let me let me field the question. We get this question a lot. If you've had prior spine surgery, whether you had a fusion, artificial disc, whatever, it doesn't matter. If you're having pain, AP, if you're having pain, we can fix it with this surgery, the laser surgery, okay? So do not get another fusion. Folks, if you haven't figured it out yet, we are not recommending spinal fusions for herniated disc, bulging disc, neck pain, back pain, arm pain. We are recommending this new surgery all right, go back to a lateral. If, you, if you're not convinced, take a look at this incision. Can you see that right there? Are you zooming in on the incision? John. Yes, we can see it. That's my finger. Look at that, that's four millimeters, folks. It's a bloodless surgery with a tiny little hole. Why would you do a fusion with a giant incision, scar tissue, muscle damage, removing a bone in your spine and the joints, fusing your joints, putting metal in your body, cages in your body, and cadaver bone. I mean, honestly, I, I'm not trying to be offensive here, but if you're watching this surgery and you're even considering a fusion, you need to go get the head examined. Shot. I mean, that's why we're broadcasting. Sorry, but we're broadcasting because we want people to see there's an alternative to fusion that's far better on every single account. There's nothing about fusion that's better. Shot. All right, so I'm caught on a hump. I need to get up the hump. Shot. I need an AP. 
Yeah, don't, don't do spinal fusions, don't do artificial discs. This is a natural repair. There's no metal, there's no fusing, there's no cages. So basically I'm just caught in like a bone spur in the front of the spine. Okay, lateral. All right, so I need to get over the hump, basically. You've got the neck in locked, and there's that little bone spur right there. You can actually see it on the x-ray. And I just need to get up and over it. Sometimes easier said than done. Wow, that was good. That was a blow for freedom. Let's get another AP. As I make these moves on the lateral up the spine, you must recheck. Huh? You must recheck AP. Because if you slide to the side and start running along the vertebral artery, it's going to be really bad. Okay, we're good. Back to a lateral. So there's a little trough between the longest colon muscles, and you just got to stay along that as you move up or down. But you have to keep checking the AP to make sure you're right on the spinous process. Okay, so we just got to get past this disc that we already fixed and just go up one more. Shot. shot AP feel like I'm going to the side I need to know which side so I can correct it as you go to the side you'll see the tip sink it almost looks like it's going into the vertebral body but it's not yeah so I'm off to her left I go back to the center and I go up a little bit shot perfect lateral quick quick you see why fluoro is so important in these surgeries. You need to have immediate information like pronto. Anybody know where pronto comes from? Anybody? Do we have any Hardy Boy readers shot? Hardy Boys? No? AP? Come on! Don't tell me you didn't read the Hardy Boys when you were younger, Zane. Oh my gosh, it's so sad. All right, if you have kids that are young, make them read the Hardy Boys. They're wonderful books. Beautiful. Frank and Joe Hardy. Lateral. So I'm docking my dilator. We're just about done. Remember, we're going into the C3-4. It's the last disc we're doing. Beautiful, beautiful. I'll just re-aim my trajectory a little bit, get through the annulus shot. Yeah. Now I'm in. I'm in the jelly substance. Beautiful. All right, so I'm about to go to the posterior tear, but I want to get a discogram real quick. So I'm going to pipe it. By the way, our next surgery is a single level cervical, single level cervical disc herniation, and our patient has neck and arm pain. Oh, no. Sean? I think our next patient, are they Canadian or? Yes. We have two Canadian patients today, and then we have somebody from Oh, I thought it was two. No. Are you sure? Yeah, one is from Virginia, one is from Jacksonville, one is local, and one is Canadian. All right, one Canadian, one from Virginia, <coughs> one from Jacksonville. Little cat hair on there. Where is the cat? <laughs> Joking. Yeah, Joking. We're not cat people here. How many cat people do we have here? Shot. All right, there's your discogram. You can see a little of the dye has leaked out the front behind the esophagus. Uh-huh. Interesting. Interesting. Dye. Allergic. Inflammation. Know anybody with inflammation? Understand? Yeah, I understand. That's why, 
that could be yeah more likely all right folksies are you a cat person how many cat people are here be honest Dr. Rafferty, are you a cat person? You have a cat? Yeah. All right, I'll see you later. Goodbye. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I love cats, to be honest with you. I like them. My husband's allergic. Ah. They're cute. The only thing is they're just so aloof, you know? Yeah, that is. It's like so hard, even when you have them. Dogs just greet you. Cats. Yeah, I know there are cats that do. I'm not... Okay, please don't hate on me because I'm saying anything about cats. Oh, I need to advance the dilator a little bit. I'm not happy with its position. We did the discogram. You can see the die. Shot. Okay. Again, you want to monitor with your x-ray to make sure the tip of the dilator doesn't go past. You can see the herniation, by the way, folks, just to the right of the, of the tip of the dilator. There's like a a little uh, convexity there. That may be the herniation, it may be the pedicle, it's hard to tell, but it's in the right place. All right, we're about to enter the disc. Once again, we're sliding along the dilator with the tube. Sean, are you pulling by any chance? I want you to pull the head towards you. Not hard, but just like firm. That'll open the disc up. It'll make this slide faster and easier. Getting there. Almost done. Just a little more shot. Remember, this is the number three, four disc. So how, one, one more second and I'll have it done. How common, shot, how common is C3, four disc herniations that are causing symptoms? Not common at all. So it's unusual. Can it happen in a work injury? Absolutely. Done, you can relax, we're done, all right. So we've gotten our tube into our last disc, the number three, four disc. I saved it for last yep, because it's honestly, in my opinion, the one causing the least of her symptoms, but she's still having symptoms. So if I got the other two and I'd be very happy. What can I expect for this patient? I believe her neck pain will be completely gone. Her headaches will be gone. Her left arm symptoms will be completely gone. I'm very confident of it. All right, next question from our audience. We're gonna be done in 10 minutes to 15 minutes, so get ready to wake her up. Uh, who has the next question for us? Yes, one of our viewers is asking, what size scope do you use? What size scope? Yes. Well, honestly, I don't know the length, but the, uh, the width of this scope is 3.2 millimeters. 3.2 millimeters, either 3.2 or 3.4, but it's, it's under four millimeters. And it's a Wolf, W-O-L-F, it's FDA approved. Everything we do in this surgery is FDA approved. Um, we don't, you know, you can't, you can't do surgery or treat patients with anything that isn't FDA approved in the United States. You can in other countries. FDA approved has to do with um, basically a vetting, vetting process that the government um, goes through for every medical device or drug that's sold in the United States and it's called the FDA review process. And of course, everything from metal plates to drugs, cancer treating drugs, everything before it's given to a patient has to be FDA approved unless it's investigational, meaning, um, it's unproven. And unfortunately, uh, a lot of insurance companies have now <laughs> are trying to not pay for things saying they're not, they're investigational, but everything is FDA approved that we do. So it can't possibly be investigational. So it's just craziness. The insurance companies will say anything they can to get out of, try to get out of paying for things. The good news is we have um, a really good team of lawyers who uh, are not afraid to take on the big bully of healthcare, basically, and do what's right for people so that people get the medical care that's the best for them. 
This type of treatment should be available to any patient worldwide that has a herniated disc or bulging disc causing pain. Uh, if you're not sure, if you have that, contact Duke Spine Institute through our website, submit an MRI review. Um, if you have an MRI, we need you to send the pictures along with the report. And we can look at that and Luis and I will tell you if you have a problem we can fix. And if you have a herniated disc or stenosis or degenerated disc or bulging disc, any of those conditions, they're all fixable with the laser surgery. So you don't need to undergo fusions. You don't need to undergo artificial discs. They're completely unnecessary and harmful, in my opinion, to you. There are a small number of people that do need fusions, but it's about 1% of all the fusions being done today are people who, you know, there's no other choice for them but a fusion. So are fusions bad surgeries? No, they're just not the best surgery, okay? Not even close to being the best. This surgery you're watching now is the future of spine surgery. Our surgery has been peer reviewed and published in the National Library of Medicine as being safe and effective for the treatment of degenerated discs, herniated discs, bulging discs, and pain. Pain in the neck, pain in the back, pain in the arm, pain in the leg, anything coming from the spine. All right, what other questions do you have there, John? There are no other questions at this time. No other questions, excellent. So we're just about done. I'm gonna come and answer questions. Uh, we're gonna do a face-to-face -face in a few minutes where I come to you and talk to you and I can answer questions. So this would be a great time to ask questions. Uh, start typing them up and I'll head over there as soon as I'm done. I'm gonna be done in about five minutes here. Um, we're just getting the last uh, herniated disc treated. Turn around here. As soon as I'm done with this, we will uh, head over to the conference room and I can answer your questions for you. Again, scar tissue here with calcium, dystrophic calcification. Just about done. A little bleeding from the end plate. You see that over there, that little red flare to the right of my laser? That's just the vein or the bone. Pretty heavy scarring here. This is the herniation right there. That's the annular tear. I'm debriding it. Of course, it's getting a little more difficult for you all to see because of the, the blood. It makes it hazy, but no worries. Good news is I can actually see what I'm doing. And I can see it with something called the mind's eye. How many people know what the mind's eye is? Hmm? Just the process of visualization. Yes, it is the process of visualization. It has to do with a uh, metaphysical world and being out of your body and being able to go somewhere and visualize something. So it, it has many applications. Like right now I can... Um, Visualize my wife working over at the administrative center. I could visualize John sitting at the controls with a little smirk on his face right now. But I could also visualize the bleeding from the end plate right there. Okay, not a big deal. Um, so being able to leave your body and your physical self where you are right now and just go out and think about something else, visualize it. It's very useful and something that I think reading helps people do because when you're reading you, you actually leave your world and you go into the world of the book, into the world of whatever that book is, a fantasy is, and you, uh, you can experience it with the characters, you can go along. And that's part of an out-of-body experience. So reading is very important. I'm a big reader of paperback books. I like paperback books. I don't like digital books. 
I like having a book in my hand, feeling its pages, turning its pages, smelling a book. Have you ever smelt an old book? It has a smell. It's quite a nice smell, actually. A tome. Anybody know what a tome is? It's a, it's a book. Usually a hardback book. Just about done. But books, paper books, have a feel, a smell, and a look. And it creates a different experience than a digital book. So I think everyone should read a, a book, paper book, at some point. If you're young, don't just do digital books. You're missing something very important, an important experience. This is probably the last herniation we're going to grab out of here, and then we're done. So I hope my students in California who've been watching our surgeries, we're barely dripping. I'm not sure why, but we should have more irrigation. It's not terrible, but if we could do a little better, it'd be great. Um, yeah. So there's that herniation. Again, it's, it's a little better. This thing is just still stuck down. I have to release it, as you can see I'm doing. And hopefully that'll blast it out. Five minutes or less will be done. This is just hypertrophied um, capsule, actually, uh, of the uh, uncinate joint. It's like a ligament, basically, right at the uncinate process. And this is not on the nerve, so it's a good thing. We're gonna leave the rest of that alone. Just try to break this up. There we go, finally. And that should do it. Man, maybe a little bit more here. Our next surgery is a single level cervical. This was a three level, in case you were wondering. Three discs, three levels needed to be done. That's one of the things we do at Duke Spine for our patients. We, we don't make them keep coming back for three or four surgeries, you know, like other places do. We'll fix it all in one shot for you. Um, typically, we can fix four areas. Either both sides of a disc would be two or, you know, four different discs um, in one surgery. After that, it starts getting a little too long and too tedious and too much anesthesia for one sitting. You all right? All right, I am, I'm done. I don't see any more loose fragments of herniation. We're done. I've debrided the annulus. Ah, just this right here, look at that. Sneaky little guy. Come on. That's not all of it. It's breaking up into pieces, floating them out. All right, type your questions and we will answer them. Ah, let's see if I can grab it out. 30 seconds and we'll be done. Got it. We are done. All right, take a look at what we've got here, folks. John, come on in. <clears throat> so how much blood did we lose? I would say two drops. 
Can you imagine having three disc surgery in your neck and only losing two drops of blood? Well, that's the Duke laser disc repair, endoscopic surgery. Can it be any other surgery you'd lose lots more blood? Laser off, scope off, please. And this is not being done in a hospital, by the way. This is outpatient. This patient's going to go home in about an hour from now, and we'll probably get her on video doing that. She allows us. She'll tell us her story. Of course, we'll see her again tomorrow as well. All righty. So we're going to come out. Uh, before I do, I want to show you this setup here. Can you see it, John? Yes, so I can. In case you didn't get a good look, this is the endoscope. We have a camera here, high definition. We've got our scope here. And just to show you what I'm talking about, we'll break the camera off. That's the camera. This is the scope. It has a light source, which provides illumination way down at the end. Okay, and that comes from a very powerful halogen, take it, halogen bulb. Okay, then we've got our irrigation here, which pumps irrigation in. Okay, and we can stop that as well. Go ahead, Luis. Then we've got our laser fiber here, blue thing. And you can see the laser fiber is half a millimeter width. But look at how small that is, guys and gals. Look how tiny that is. I mean, in the scope, it looked huge, didn't it? All right. And now the whole surgery is done through this tiny little tube called the tubular retractor. And I'm going to, it's attached to suction, by the way, so we can suck, but I don't really use the suction very much. And we're going to take this out. As we do, I'm going to put some pressure. And then I'm going to show you, see that? That's a four millimeter incision. Can you see that, John? Yes, we can see In it. In the front of her neck. Pretty incredible. But this is the future of advanced spine surgery. Well, th there will always be fusions available because there's always going to be people that go to war with clubs and stones and, you know, harpoons and arrows. But for those who want the most advanced technology in the world for their spine, this is it. This is it. No collateral damage, literally nothing inside damaged, just spread. The only damage to this whole surgery is that cut on the front of her neck, that four millimeter cut. When you have a fusion surgery, there's massive damages done everywhere. And here's the cut right here, four millimeters. You all see that, John? The whole thing done with a four millimeter incision. Hold this. Yes, we We're going to hold pressure for a couple of minutes just to make sure there's no venous bleeding. We're done. I'm going to come over there and answer questions. So type your questions up, folks. Great job, everyone. Beautiful, beautiful job. Everything went really well. I'm very pleased. Let's just put that esophagus probe every time, I think. Or, or you can ask me in the beginning. But like a super skinny neck, we probably don't need it. Okay. But something like this we do. It really helps. All right, type up your questions and I'll be over there. I'm going to call our EBL one mil, even though it's less than a mil. One mil, by the way, is 20 drops, for those of you who don't know. I need a pin.
that was probably one of the things I noticed right away was that like I had some control again, which was kind of cool, you know? You still have that sort of, your brain's relearning where things are again. So now that you're, you're back to getting healthy, it's, it's starting to come back. You're starting to feel like you're, you're able to play. But, uh, but uh, yeah, I'll play. This song is called Oscar the Grouch Goes to the Movies. So yeah, we're a pretty musical family here. We do play a lot of shows. We're in a band called Positive Chaos, and uh, this is my bass. Picked it up a little while ago. Um, we use it for acoustic shows. This is actually our guitarist's acoustic guitar. Um, he actually just moved down here from Connecticut, so it's kind of cool having him down. This is our violinist and my fiance's violin, who uh, has been in the band with us for a bunch of years now, and she's having some fun with that. This here is my acoustic guitar, um, which we'll be hanging out with later. And then this is our drummer's bassist of all things. So uh, yeah, that's, that's that guy. And uh, a couple months ago, it'd be pretty much impossible to pick this guy up off the wall without some pain. So it's kind of cool that I'm able to start doing that again um, from here. And I waited for you. So that was cool. Like uh, at this point, I wouldn't have been able to do this, I don't know, a month ago. And now I'm able to play guitar again. So it's kind of nice getting back. And uh, getting the band Positive Chaos back together is going to be pretty fun, and we're really looking forward to it. Thanks, Dr. Duke. And we know this is the way to live. And you keep on coming back. Um, yeah, so my name is Dave. Um, last year I was in an auto accident. It was August. Um, T-bone accident in the area. Um, suffered some neck injuries basically kind of uh, spent some months just kind of dealing with it then decided to uh, talk to a chiropractor, started looking at it. Uh, from there, we I did the epidural injections. And those were uh, pretty successful. I was feeling a little better. And then uh, woke up one day early, I think it was March, and I was agony. Like I couldn't move, couldn't lift my arm, aggravating the bottoms of my fingers, like everything, everything hurt from the base of my skull down to all the way into the very base of my pinky. So it was, it was kind of tough. Like, you know, everything that you did is now different. Like, you're, everything hurts. And it, you know, it makes you irritable. It's, it's, it's like this like burning, stinging pain. So you, you kind of spend a lot of time like going around things. You spend a lot of time like tiptoeing through what you can and can't do. And so I decided it was time to, time to see somebody about it. So I went and found Dr. Duke Majin. You know, you spend a lot of time going to different doctor's offices for something like this because you don't really know. You're, 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 looking for, you're looking for something to fix you. So I, I actually found Dr. Duke Majin online. Like it wasn't, it wasn't like a referral sort of deal. So I go into the office and it's, it's bright, which is different. A lot of doctor's offices are dark and they're kind of scary. So you go in and everybody's pretty happy. You're like, okay, this is a change. And uh, you know, you talk to the staff there and they're, they're excited to see you. Not only that, but they booked me the day after. Like I called them and they, they had a spot for me the day, the next day. That was huge. So, uh, you know, you go in there and you're talking to them and they're, they're, you know, they're exuding this like sort of air that things are gonna be okay. And uh, they send you in and I, I met with uh, Dr. Duke Majin's assistant, Luis, who's a great guy. Um, he started setting me up and he's going through the x-rays and kind of saying like, hey, listen, this is what you got going on. Dr. Duke Majin's gonna come in and explain it further to you. So Dr. Duke Majin comes in and uh, he's, he's got an air of confidence about him. You, you feel better when he's talked to this guy and he's, I remember him saying like, you know, you're, you're in trouble. You're, you have some issues here. But as he left, he was like, but we're gonna patch you up. And that was the first time that I didn't feel fear in like three months. It was the first time that you felt good. You felt like, we're gonna be okay. We're getting back to being okay. And that was a huge thing. Like this confidence that he had, this swagger that he had until he came in and he was like, we're gonna patch you up. And that was it. And it was like, all right, that's, that's huge. Like that was a huge feeling. Yeah, when I woke up in surgery, I, I noticed that I was, I could, it felt like a garden hose had unraveled in my arm. Like, I could feel things again, like it wasn't this like wrapped up tight pain. Like, yeah, there's, there's obviously surgical pain involved there, but it's, you know, you feel instantly better than you were. And it's, it's kind of this, it's no longer like shooting down into your arms. It just feels like things are starting to heal. Like things are back in the order that they should be. They're back kind of feeling the way that they should. So, uh, and that was something I noticed that day. Like, 
you know, you're a little groggy from the medicine and all that stuff, but at the same time, you feel better, like instantly. If you have neck pain, like or back pain, any anything spinal, like these are the guys to talk to. These are the best in the business. Like, this is this is what they do, and uh, yeah, I'd highly recommend them. I would recommend them, friends, family, strangers, absolutely. Like, they're, yeah, I would highly recommend Doctor Duke Major. That's, and that's the end of it right there. So, yeah. Since the surgery out with uh, Doctor Duke, I'm able to get back to what I love to do, and that's the best part of it. Like, Doctor Duke set me on the path to getting back to doing what I love. So that's huge. And that's, yeah, I mean, that's, that's awesome. Thanks, Dr. Duke. Wow. That's amazing. Thanks. That was probably one of the things I noticed right away was that, like, I had some... Hello, I'm Dr. Duke Majin. We just finished doing a three-level cervical Duke laser disc repair. Our patient had herniated discs, which for those of you who don't know what a herniated disc is, the spine is made up of bones stacked on top of each other. Um, this is a better visualization of that. These are the bones, they're hard, and they're stacked on top of each other. They go all the way up to your skull, and the skull sits on the top of the spine. This is the lower back but it's easier to see because the bones are bigger. And then between these bones, you got a disc or cushion. And back pain, neck pain, thoracic pain comes from a tear in the back of those discs that have some jelly squeezed into the tear and that creates inflammation, constant inflammation, constant pain. It kind of heals a little bit in most people and then they do something like pick something up, bend, twist, and it makes another tear or makes the tear wider and it creates that cycle of inflammation and healing, inflammation and healing. So the inflammation causes pain, the healing causes relief. So people who have herniated discs in their back and neck, they get horrible pain in their neck, down their arms, or in their lower back, down their legs. And um, when they take it easy for a few days, it kind of heals a little bit, the inflammation settles down, but then they get active again, and that just causes the tear to get um, re-injured and inflamed. So what does the Duke Laser Disc Repair do? It's a surgery that actually I go in and I clean up the tear and I get rid of that piece of herniation stuck between the tear. It is the first surgery of its kind in the world. No one else does this. Everyone else goes for the mushroom cap, but nobody looks at the mushroom stalk that's still in there. And it's the mushroom stalk that actually causes all the symptoms. Every spine surgery available today deals with the mushroom cap. And uh, the Duke Laser Disc Repair is the only one that actually deals with the stalk. And so we fixed three discs in this patient, uh, C3, 4, 4, 5, 5, 6. Our patient was asleep for the whole surgery. And we basically made a tiny little four millimeter cut on the neck. Everybody says about a week later, you can't even see the incision. So they're amazed that that surgery can be done with such a tiny incision. Duke Spine Institute's the only place in the world you're gonna get this surgery done. Why? It's very complicated surgery. It's very hard to do and there's nobody else trained to do it. Uh, it also takes millions of dollars worth of very advanced equipment and you can't find that everywhere in every street corner. So for the time being, this is the place to go if you want this very state-of-the-art surgery done. Uh, let's take our questions. Um, there are none. <laughs> they, they've <laughs> all been answered. They've all been answered, all right, very good. Uh, I've enjoyed our time together. Our next surgery is going to be a one-level cervical disc herniation. Our patient is from Canada, I believe. I think he's from Canada. Um, and then after that, we have a lady with uh, two herniated discs in her back, L3-4, L4-5, and pain going into her leg. Uh, we'll do her Duke laser disc repair, endoscopic surgery. And then the last one of the day is gonna be a fascinating, it's a young man who was working at Amazon where he actually injured his back lifting boxes and um, has a herniated disc in the thoracic spine, high up at T45, uh, I believe. So this is a thoracic disc herniation. This is a true treat for those of you who like to watch these surgeries. We rarely do thoracic herniations. I've only done 10 in my entire career. I started doing them a year ago in 2020. And in one year, I've done basically 10 of them. And they've all been successful at eliminating the pain. 
So this will be number 11, okay? And it's a single level T45, I believe, uh, and the patient's in horrible pain. He just can't even stand. Uh, and he is, he is very, it's a very sad story. He had to lose his job. He's a young guy. He's, he's um, yeah, we got a video of him before surgery. It just honestly makes me so sad to see people like him suffering. He was able to scrape together the money to pay for the surgery. We gave him an incredible discount. Um, and he's going to be having that surgery done today. So it's going to be a really nice one. I really hope it works for him. All right, talk to you later.